So Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 19. If you're able, will you stand with me as we honor God and the reading of His Word? Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 19. A story from Jesus that you've probably heard before. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was left at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot, neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send Lazarus to my father's house, because I have five brothers to warn them, so that they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. May God add his blessing to the reading and now the preaching and teaching of his holy word. May Jesus Christ, our Savior, forever be praised and all of God's people say, Amen. you may be seated. The title of the sermon this morning is, Hell is Real. I say again, Hell is Real. In the last several years, there's been a lot of emphasis in pop culture on heaven. There have been multiple books and movies like uh, Heaven is for Real, 90 Minutes in Heaven, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, and already one of those books, I can't remember which one of them, but the, one of the, the children grew up and said he made it all up and that it's not true. So uh, you can't put too much emphasis on those things. We need to get our theology from the Bible, amen? Go to the Bible first. The Bible confirms what we believe. But that, that information has been out there and, and it's been popular, very popular. It's sold a lot of books. It's sold a lot of movie tickets about heaven being real. And those are good things to talk about. And we, we sing about heaven. So many of the songs in our hymn book are about heaven. And I'm going to tell you, I, you just hardly can't find a hymn about hell. I mean, we, either they didn't make it into the hymn book or nobody ever wrote them. But Heaven is way more popular to talk about, right? Do you see what I'm saying? We'd rather, way rather hear about the glories of heaven and the joy of heaven and the comfort and consolation of heaven. But at some point, we've got to be told about the alternative to heaven. And that is hell. And Jesus makes it very clear this morning. Jesus Jesus speaks to us in no uncertain terms that hell is real. We begin with point number one, if you're doing the Bible treasure map. Number one, the horrible reality of hell. The horrible reality of hell. Jesus believed in hell. Now listen, I know there's a lot of overeducated eggheads. I shouldn't have said eggheads, that was ugly. 
There's a bunch of overeducated people in the pulpit today and in seminary classes today and on television shows today who tell you that hell is just a figment of our imagination, that hell is a myth. It, it was a tool that was used by ancient man to, to scare people into believing in, in that type of faith or religion. It, it's not real, though. It's something from a bygone era. It, it's something from past generations. We've moved on past that. We have evolved beyond that. We no longer believe in hell. But from Folks, I tell you today that Jesus believed in hell, and I believe in hell. Hell is a reality. And hell is something that I would rather not talk about, but compassion demands that I do. We have two choices in ministry. We can comfort people on their path going down to hell, or we can warn them to turn around and go the other direction. Jesus says, broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction. But small is the path, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. We must acknowledge, if we believe in heaven, we must also acknowledge that hell is real. And hell is a horrible reality. A horrible reality. If we understood just how horrible hell is, we would change our perception, we would change our language. See, most people who even say they believe in hell don't really believe in the horrors of hell, or they wouldn't use hell as a curse word, and they wouldn't use it so casually, and they wouldn't throw it into everyday conversation the way they do, if they understood just how bad hell is. They wouldn't make a joke of it. Folks, hell is real. And it is a horrible reality. It is a horrible reality. It's not only real, it's bad. Look what this rich man, the rich man, um, history tells us, it may be apocryphal, but uh, I'm going to stick with it, says that his name was Dives. This is the story of, of Lazarus and Dives. So the rich man Dives, he dies, and the, the text here places him in, in Hades, the Greek word for what is often translated for hell. The place of punishment is a place of torment, and he is there, and he says, I am in torment in these flames. What is his request? What does he want? He wants just a drop of water. He wants just, send Lazarus just to dip his finger in water. If I could just have one drop of water, because I am tormented in this fire. I am tormented in these flames. And we read also in uh, various places in the New Testament that it's a, hell is a place of separation. It is a p place where the worm never dies and the flame is never quenched. And it is a place of outer darkness. Now imagine that. A place where there are never-ending worms, burning fire, and darkness. That sounds horrible. You see, we don't understand the horrors of hell. If we did, we would change our perception, we would change our language, we would change our reaction. If we believed, if we truly believed that hell was so bad, we would be doing all that we can to keep people from going there. Amen? And you see, here's the thing. Not only is hell real and not only is it bad, but hell's forever. Father Abraham says to the rich man there in hell, he says, there's a great chasm a great valley, a great gulf that has been fixed between you and me so that nobody over here can go over there and nobody over there can go over there. When you are in hell, you are there forever. Hell is a place of no more chances. I want you to hear me well. Hell is a place of no more chances. Hell is a place of no hope. Hell is a place of no turning back. When you're there, the deal is done. It's forever. Never ending. Can you imagine being in such torment and knowing that it's never going to get better? Can you imagine being there and knowing that there's no way out? Can you imagine being there and knowing that there's no Hope left for me. That nothing can change this. You, you see, friends, that's why we need to preach the horrors and reality of hell. Because it's real and it's bad and it's forever. Let me give you an example. I've used this illustration many times. If, um, if you're going up in an airplane 
And, and you get on this airplane, and, and uh, the, uh, the stewardess, we can't say stewardess anymore, that's not politically correct. The flight attendant comes to you, and the flight attendant has this 60-pound backpack and says, here, put this backpack on. It's going, you, you're going to have a purpose-filled flight with this backpack. You're going to have blessings in great abundance with this backpack. You're, you're, this backpack is going to make you more comfortable. It's going to make the flight smoother. This backpack is going to do all of these great and wonderful things for you while you're on this flight. And so you say, that sounds really good. Put, give me a backpack and you put it on. And you wear it. And you start squirming around because you realize this isn't making my flight more comfortable. This is an agitation. This isn't making the flight smoother. This isn't helping me at all. That was all a lie. So you take the backpack off and you set it to the side. But what if the flight attendant came to you and said, here's this 60-pound backpack, put it on because inside of it is a parachute. And in about 10 minutes, we're going to be out of fuel and this plane is going to crash and you're going to have to bail out. And this backpack and the parachute within it are the only thing that's going to save your life. Then what do you do? You hold on to that backpack. It wouldn't matter if it weighed 160 pounds. You would not get rid of it. I mean, it wouldn't matter how uncomfortable it was. It wouldn't matter how rough the flight it made. You wouldn't get rid of that backpack, right? So here's what we do. A lot of times the church does this. We'll tell people, well, just get saved and, and just uh, come to church and, and be a sweet, kind person and all your problems will go away and your uh, path will be smooth and your children will start behaving and your bald head will grow hair and your bank account will, will bloom and, and blossom. And, and they, Yeah, they make all kind of promises. And you make all these promises about all this cotton candy fluff and then real life sets in. Then reality begins to set in, and people say, well, what that preacher told me wasn't true at all. There was nothing to that. But if we tell people that there is a hell to pay for the sins of man, and unless you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be in the same place that rich man was, with the flames and the outer darkness and the worm that never dies, and you're going to be there for eternity. Then people say, tell me more about that. What's the alternative to that? Amen? The horrible reality of hell. But number two, I want you to see, not only the horrible reality of hell, but a human response in hell. In hell. Hell is a place of no hope. It is a place of no more chances. But I'm going to tell you this, hell is a place of compassion. What did that rich man do? After, after Abraham told him that I can't send Lazarus to you and he can't cross over to you and you can't cross over to him, then the rich man in hell realizes something, that the light bulb, bulb comes on, the bell dings, and he says, oh, I've got five brothers, and they're coming to this same place. I've got five brothers that still have a chance if they'll turn around. I have five brothers, and they're on the same road that I was on. They're coming to this same place as me. Oh, I don't want them to come here. So then he says, Father Abraham, if you could just send Lazarus back from the dead to go and warn my brothers not to come here. What does Abraham respond? Abraham responds and says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let your brothers listen to them. What is Moses and the prophets? Moses and the prophets is the Bible. Moses, when he's speaking of Moses, he's talking about the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first five books of Moses. That's the title above uh, those books of the Bible in many Bibles still. The prophets are the rest of the Old Testament. The Isaiah and Ezekiel and Amos and Hosea and Malachi. The prophets, the Old Testament, that, that's the Bible that existed back then. And he said, let him hear the Bible. If you want your five brothers to truly believe, it doesn't matter. Even if somebody rises from the dead, if they won't believe the Bible, they're not going to believe some big flashy, dashy, crowd-drawing fluff. Do you know how people are saved? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
And how shall they hear it? How shall they hear unless there's a preacher to preach to him? And how shall the preacher preach unless he is called or sent? People are saved by hearing the word of God. That's what Abraham told the rich man. Your brothers have the word of God. If they won't believe the word of God, they're not going to believe even if somebody rises from the dead. Do you see the message, though? The message of compassion? That man, that rich man in hell, was concerned about his brothers. Here's what is so shocking to me. The people in hell today are more concerned about lost people still on earth than the people sitting on our church pews. What a shame. You say, oh no preacher, we're very concerned about lost people. When was the last time you shared your faith? When was the last time you gave somebody a New Testament or a gospel tract? When was the last time you handed out one of those uh, free CDs in the back? When was the, the last time... The people in hell have more compassion for lost people than the people on planet earth have for lost people, than people in churches. If we had the same compassion, I'm just going to preach a little bit, okay? If we had the same compassion for lost people in the church, if the church had the same compassion for lost people that people in hell have for lost people, we wouldn't be cutting 600 missionaries from our international mission board right now. We'd be sending more missionaries out there into the deepest, darkest jungles, into the driest, arid desert, into the, the heartland of lost countries and cities. We wouldn't be cutting missionaries. We'd be sending more because more people would be concerned and more people would be giving to missions. If the people in hell had it, they'd give it because they don't want anybody else to come to hell. The horrible reality of hell is that it's real, it's bad, and it's forever. The human response in hell is that of compassion. Uh, hey, boys and girls, men, women, everybody here, listen. Uh, there's that old response and that old frame of mind that uh, when, when I ask somebody, it's been a long time since people, someone has responded this way, but it's happened. Well, I'll ask them, do you know that, that Jesus is your Savior and that heaven will be your home? And, and somebody has responded before that, well, I, I don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> None of my friends are going to be there. I want to be where, where they are in hell. No, you don't. That's a lie. The people in hell don't want you to join them. Hell has a lot of compassion for people who, who are on the way there. Don't come here. So there is that horrible reality of hell, the human response in hell, and then the, the heavenly Reply. This is point number three, the heavenly reply to hell. The reply that Abraham gives is, look, every opportunity has been given to you to not come to hell. Every opportunity has been given to you so that you don't have to, so your brothers don't have to come here. You see, folks, here's the reality. God doesn't send anyone to hell. Listen carefully again. God does not send anyone to hell. If you go to hell, you go there by climbing over the gospel. You go to hell by running past his preachers. You go there around the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you go to hell, it is your own fault. Your fault. You see, the thing is, people go to hell... Because they can't go to heaven. That's why people go to hell. This is hard to grasp, and I, I wonder whether or not to even to, to bring it up, but I'm going to give you something to chew on, okay? For somebody who's lost and bound for hell, their sins are still on their soul. Their sins have not been washed away. For that person to go to heaven would be worse than going to hell. Now, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? We sang the song, Rock of Ages. And do you remember what the, the song is based on? It's based on the uh, account in Exodus where Moses goes up on the mountain to hear from God. 
Go, Moses goes up on the mountain and he says to God, God, I want to see your glory. And God says to Moses, you cannot see my glory or you, you shall surely die or you shall surely be destroyed. So God says to Moses, I'm going to place you in this cave, in the cleft of this rock. And I'm going to place my hand over the, the rock the cave entrance. And I'm going to walk past you, God tells Moses. And after I am past you, you can see me as I'm walking away. You can see me from the back, but you cannot see my glory from the front or you will surely be destroyed. Heaven is filled with the glory of God. If someone is still in their sins, their sins have not been washed away, they would be in constant destruction even in heaven. People go to hell because they cannot go to heaven. They cannot be in the presence of the glory of God. I want you to understand this, get it, make sure it's clear. If your sins have not been washed away, if if your sins have not been washed away, if you've not been born again, your sins are still on your soul, If you die today, you cannot go to heaven. You cannot go. And the only alternative, the only other choice, is hell. It's so serious. I'm just going to, I've told you this before too. I'm not going to hell. If there was a doubt in my mind, I would be on my face before Almighty God. And I wouldn't get up from kneeling until I got it right. I don't want to go a day. I don't want to go a minute. I don't want to go a second without knowing that Jesus is my Savior and that heaven will be my home. You can... You can have that uncertainty if you want to, but that's not why Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross for your sins, and He rose again so you can know, so you can know, so that you can be assured, so that you don't have to go through life doubting and wondering, and, well, I'm saved today and I'm lost tomorrow. No, friends, when Jesus Christ washes away your sins, He washes away your sins past, present, future. How old were you when Jesus died on the cross? You were not born yet. How many of your sins had you committed? None of them and all of them at the same time. When Jesus died on the cross, the payment for sin is death. He cried out the word, tetelestai, it is finished. It was finished at that moment. And your sins were cast into the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered no more. Hell is real, it is bad, and it is forever. Hear the warning from the one in hell. The voices of those in hell cry out, Don't come here. For heaven's sake, don't come here. And then they cry out, Warn somebody. Tell somebody not to come to this place. And lastly, remember, there is only one alternative to hell And that's heaven. And the way we go to heaven is by being born again. By having our sins washed away. By placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Do you know? Are you certain? Is there doubt in your heart and in your mind? Friends, don't leave here today without knowing that Jesus is your Savior and knowing that heaven will be your home. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the cost of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Be saved today. We're going to have an invitation hymn. 
And when the hymn begins, if you need to be saved, if you need to know, here's what we're going to do. I don't often do this, but I feel led to this morning. I'm going to ask everyone to bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. You, you say, I, I'm here and, and I need to be saved, but everybody else already thinks that I'm saved. doesn't matter what they think. You get it right with God today. If you admit to God that you're a sinner and you're ready to repent and turn away from your sins, and you believe in Jesus that He's God's Son, and that He died on the cross for your sins and that He rose again, and you're ready to confess Him publicly as your Savior and Lord, then right now I'm going to ask you to, to pray a simple prayer, sort of like this. It doesn't have to be these exact words, and this prayer is not in the Bible, but you can pray these words with me and ask Jesus to save you. Just pray along with me if you feel so led. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me and take away my sins. I believe in Jesus, your Son, that He died on the cross and rose again. I want Him to be my Lord and be my Savior. I confess the name of Jesus. I believe that you have saved me. I believe that you have forgiven me. Thank you. Now help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer or one similar, you meant that in your heart, I'm going to ask you in this hymn of invitation to walk down this aisle. I'll be here. Pastor Eric will be here. The Bible says in Acts chapter 22, what are you waiting for? Rise up and be baptized washing away your sins by calling upon His name. You need to be baptized. That may be what's missing in your life. You, you, you just feel in, your, feel in your heart something's missing. That may be the thing that's missing. You step forward in faith. You get right with God today. Don't wait as we sing, you come.